Turkish Airlines presents Business Africa. Greetings and a warm welcome to today's edition of Business Africa. I'm your host, Afolake Oinlui. Here this week's headlines. UN urges fossil fuel phase out in the recently concluded COP28 facing resistance from oil producers, while Africa's climate future injures and lessen damage fund and financial commitments. Egyptian president's bid for thought term faces soaring inflation and foreign exchange crisis. Experts emphasize the urgent need for growth. Cameroon's major cities grapple with severe fuel shortage, causing long queues at operational feeding stations. The crisis attributed to adverse ocean weather conditions has led to economic slowdown. COP28 in Dubai concluded with the UN's call to face out fossil fuels, which faced resistance from major oil producers and instead led to a call for reduction. On the continental level, the focus now shifts to ensuring financial pledges support the continent's unique climate challenges. The COP28 in Dubai showcased significant progress for Africa, garnering increased global recognition and commitments that align with the continent's climate priorities. The initiation of the Loss and Damage Fund, a key outcome from the conference, underscores international support for addressing African concerns. Financial pledges such as the UAE's $30 billion pledge for private sector involvement provides momentum for climate initiatives in Africa. As the global community engages in a critical race against time to address the pressing climate crisis, COP28 in Dubai brought both optimism and challenges. The UN's call for historic agreement to phase out fossil fuels faces resistance from major oil producers like Saudi Arabia and the OPEC countries. The challenge lies in navigating opposition to fossil fuel phase out, particularly considering Saudi Arabia's status as the world's largest oil exporter. For low-lying island nations fearing the very existence due to rising sea levels, the stakes are high. The summit's focus narrowed down to two pivotal issues, the phase out of fossil fuels and the acceleration of climate finance from wealthy nations to developing countries mostly affected by climate change. As Africa seeks to leverage the global momentum generated at COP28, the establishment of the Loans and Damage Fund is a beacon of progress. However, the continent's success in addressing its unique climate challenges hinges on translating financial commitments such as the UAE Substantial Pledge into effective, well-executed projects. Mr. Ibrahim Sheikh Diang, Director General of the African Risk Capacity Group, joins us from Dubai to elaborate on that topic. Thanks for joining us on the show, sir. In reflecting on the conclusions of COP28, how would you assess the overall outcomes, including African climate finance and its priorities? Africa was much better prepared this time compared to the previous COP. As you know, Africa had its first Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi where we underline the importance of the priorities of Africa, including to make sure we reform the global climate architecture to make it work for Africa, to find a balance between development and climate change, to decarbonize the global economy, but more importantly, to make sure we actually commit the loss and damage so we can protect the most vulnerable in Africa. I feel from that perspective, the fact that the Lost and Damage Fund has been concluded in Dubai with lots of commitment from many, many active donors, that's a sign that at least the African concerns are being recognized and obviously commitment being made, that's also a very good sign. Now, from your perspective, were there notable positive or concerning aspects? Now, it's important to remember at the commitment level, for example, a country like UAE, had made a commitment to put $30 billion on the table to particularly get more private sector involvement in mitigation in the climate change field. Given that Africa has to get more involved in energy transition with renewable on the continent, the more sort of green economy, all these opportunities on the continent requires additional resources. Now, $30 billion, obviously, it's not good enough. Our needs is in the trillion. So we hope that 30 billion will provide the impetus, the catalyst to attract more private sector money. I think the biggest challenge for Africa, beyond this money, to make sure that we get project preparation right. So the project will bring forward for funding purposes are well prepared so that we can bring in bankable projects. 
One of the key issues discussed was the disparities of climate finance. Were there measures taken to address this issue? And how effective do you think this measure will be in ensuring that there is equitable distribution of climate finance? Obviously, Africa contributes less than uh, 4% to greenhouse gases. So we don't really have a mitigation problem. We have an adaptation problem. So what we need, as far as Africa is concerned, is to scale up adaptation funding so that we can help our continent to deal with the drought, the tropical cyclone, the flood across Africa. So hopefully the resources community here will help to really support African efforts in adaptations. I think second, as I said earlier, uh, loss and damage, uh, which is basically a fund that the developing countries are asking for, will go immediately in protecting the lives and livelihood of many people who are affected by climate change, but also rebuilding the infrastructures and so on and so forth. So I think it's really important that, let's say, the Lost and Damage Fund, from a governance point of view, we have the developing countries well represented to make sure our concerns are listened to. And then second, the governance is uh, uh, simple and less complex to the extent of the procedures, learning from previous fund, as such that we can provide funding in a very fast uh, way. Egypt has held its presidential election amid economic challenges. Despite the IMF intervention, the North African nation struggles with recurring debt cycles, prompting calls for growth. Experts are predicting what the future holds for the Egyptian economy. As Abdel Fattah al-Sisi vies for a third term, Egypt grapples with multifaceted economic challenges. The political transition unfolds against the backdrop of war in Gaza, intensifying global shocks and a looming foreign exchange crisis. Despite participation in various IMF programs, the nation faces challenges in breaking free from recurrent cycles of debt and financial crisis. Mohamed Filali, a tax lawyer and economist, emphasizes the critical need for sustained economic growth. And in order to, to create what Egypt needs, which is uh, around 600,000 or 500,000 jobs every year for the, the next uh, decade, uh, Egypt needs to grow 5% more than inflation in, in order to, to have the same uh, the same uh, uh, GDP per capita or real GDP per capita. Uh, there is a, a growing population that needs work, needs jobs, and th the only way to get, uh, to get them uh, uh, in, in the labor market is growing the economy in a, in, a, in, in a pace much higher than the growth of population. The fiscal year anticipated GDP growth of about 4%, reflecting ongoing struggles with economic stability. Forecast project a potential increase to 4.8% in the financial year 2024 and 5.1% in 2025. The North African nation contends with persistent high inflation and difficulties managing its balance of payment. And without the help of the international community, the country will go, uh, will go uh, uh, the way of Argentina or other countries because of the foreign exchange. Uh, struggles uh, that the government can't solve because they need foreign exchange right? and Egypt doesn't have uh, the export sector that can help and solve this problem. The only way to get the foreign exchange is from international donors, loans, international financial market. Official estimates from 2019 reveal nearly 30 percent living below the national poverty line underscoring the urgency of addressing economic issues to improve the well-being of the populace. Cameroon has witnessed a dire fuel shortage gripping Cameroon's main urban centers. The situation escalated in recent days as filling stations in the economic Abdullah struggled to meet with demands. The port city of Douala has been facing a serious shortage of petrol for several days. The shortages got worse in the capital Yawunde and Bafusam. Here at this station on Monday, endless queues of vehicles, people and motorcycle cab drivers were on the lookout for fuel. It's the raw material. Without fuel, we cannot function. We cannot do anything without it. We have to run on fuel to be able to transport people. Otherwise, how are we going to do without fuel? We also have to charge them more. The shortages have given birth to a thriving black market in the surrounding localities. 
Dealers have resorted to rationing the commodity, restricting supply to up to 3,000 francs for motorcycles and 5,000 for personal cars. It's a huge loss for the economy and for us economic operators. If we have to work for hours to get supplies, not to mention all the other inconveniences to our activities. I've been here for almost two hours. This is the third time in as many months that the country has experienced biting fuel shortages. Cameroon's energy ministry blamed the supply disruptions on the delayed arrival of three ships carrying petroleum products. And that's a wrap on this episode. Thank you for joining us on Business Africa this week. For more captivating business stories and news, stay tuned to African News and AfricanNews.com. Business Africa was presented by Turkish Airlines.